Yeah, 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 let's think about it. If you had to go into your closet today and, and pick out the suit that you were going to wear, that'd be kind of hard, wouldn't it? You ever read that book, The Last Lecture? Anybody ever see that? I think in that book right there, that man had to choose his own because he, he knew he was going to die. And, and very sad, very sad. But, uh, you know, it's something that we all have to deal with because life, it's just there's two things that you can be promised in life. What's that? Death and taxes, right, that's right. And, uh, you know, some, ter- some, uh, some presidents, uh, some, you get more than others, right? More death or, or more taxes, you know. Either they kill us or they charge us more, praise God. So, uh, but it's just, it's just a reality of life. I, I, I've been, uh, I had to help a man get, get a suit on once, and he was, uh, he was a friend of mine, and he had, uh, my brother-in-law, he passed away. He died, had an aneurysm. It was tragedy. He was a young man. And, uh, but uh, the only suit I ever, I ever owned, and I probably wore it twice in my life. And, uh, of course, he didn't have a suit, didn't own a suit. So they said, hey, can you give him your suit? Man, my only suit. But I've, I did feel honored. But, but uh, we clothed him in my suit there. And, and, uh, and so, and there he was. So, but uh, I want to talk to you this morning about grave clothes and uh, but John chapter 19 verse number 38 the Bible says and after this after Jesus had hung on the cross after this Joseph of Arimathea being a uh, disciple of Jesus but secretly for the fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the dead body of Jesus and uh, Pilate gave him leave and said okay you can do that he came therefore and took the body of Jesus and there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night. This is the same Nicodemus, and that was in John chapter 3. And, and it, they brought a mixture now of, uh, of um, aloes and myrrh and different things, and, and uh, about 100 pounds of this ointment. These guys are carrying this stuff, now 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, and they, and they wound it up in linen clothes, uh, with spices uh, as the manner of the Jews uh, to bury. Everybody say grave clothes. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden there was a new sepulcher where uh, was never a man laid yet laid. And there they laid Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. It was close by. So I want to preach to you today. Uh, about a dead man walking, dead man walking. Praise God. Father, we love you today again, and we give glory to you. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive. And I pray, God, that you would anoint the lips of clay here in my body today to speak these great words, God, to these great people. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Uh, as, as we read scripture here, the Bible describes for us the grave clothes that were worn by our Savior. Now, I, like I said, it's a bit morbid, the thought, uh, as we all must prepare for someone's funeral. I don't want to, I really don't want to bring up any bad thoughts, but I have had to prepare for a couple of funerals in my life, uh, tragedy things and young people and children that should not have passed away and we've had to bury and, uh, and I don't remember the day that they decided on my, our son who uh, we buried. I don't remember the day that we decided what clothes. I probably wasn't involved in that. But no doubt there was some thought that went into that. Maybe new clothes were purchased or something. Uh, uh, and again, I told you the story about my brother-in-law. But uh, I know there's people in this room that you've buried people that, you know, may they've lived a long life. And uh, they, they've done, uh, they were... Uh, you know, it was time for them to go, you know, and, uh, and some of those times aren't as hard, but some, I know some in here have buried people, spouses, and different things. It, it, it's tragic times in life, and those things are never fun, but, but the question I have this morning again, it was what clothes are you going to wear? What do you want to look like when you, you know, it's, when you're a kid, you know, you, you can think about that stuff, and it really doesn't cause you any grief, because when you're a kid, you're going to live forever, Right? Right? <laughs> You can drive any way you want to, you know, because you're going to live forever. You know, what kind of clothes are you going to wear? Man, you get excited. You, you kind of get excited about it. Now, if you're old, like me, 
you should think about death all the time. Like, man, he, anything could happen, you know. I could get a phone call and the doctor's office called me and, you know, that little issue, it turned out to be a big issue, you know. And you, you get scared. I know that we're dealing, we're praying for some of you right here today that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, praise God. And so it's a little bit more nerve-wracking when you start thinking about that. But uh, uh, I want you to think about Jesus now. Here, He's here and he's being wrapped up in these grave clothes. And I know it's hard for us to understand, but we, un- understanding the dual nature of Jesus Christ, that they had, to, they had to literally take a dead body off a cross. And now, I mean, think of the icon, the, the master. Here he is. He's the man that's walking around. He's healing the sick and he's, the blinded eyes are open and all of these things are happening in his ministry. And, uh, and these guys are watching it all happen. And, and uh, he said, hey, when you've seen me, you've seen God. You know, I, 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 I am the only God that you will ever see. And he's t- telling him these things. He's destroyed this body and, hey, uh, there's not going to be any issues, you know. And, and so he's, he's talking to him about all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, here is, here's Joseph and, and he sees the Savior. He's just lifeless. He's dead. On the, bo- on the cross. But I want you to know this morning that, uh, uh, that there is a dual nature of Christ. I don't want you to get mis- a misunderstanding here today. And so uh, Jesus Christ was fully man and he was fully God. Uh, the Lord did not somehow create another deity or some other God in creation somewhere and say, okay, now you go down and you do the work. No, the Bible says that the Lord himself... The God Almighty, Jehovah God, robed himself in flesh, came down to reconcile the world back to himself, because there is no other God to reconcile it to, and he is uh, in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that. The the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus Christ bodily. Not the fullness of a second person or a third person in some Godhead. No, it was the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus Christ. Uh, As God, Jesus Christ forgave sins, but as men, man, he hungered. He needed to eat. And as God, he restored sight to the blind. But as man, he prayed that he would find the will of God. Now, for all of us, that's a great mystery. And that's what the Bible says, that such is the great mystery of Christ, how God robed himself in flesh and was justified in the spirit and was preached unto the Gentiles and received up into glory. The apostle Paul said that is a great mystery. Absolutely, the dual nature of God, the dual nature of Christ here. God, he restored the sight of the blind, but he prayed that, that he would find the will of God for his life. And, and as God, as God, Jesus cleansed the sins of the world by his blood, but as man, he died on the cross. The Spirit of God was in him doing the work. He says, the, the work that you see that I do, it's the Father that, that dwells inside of me, not some second, no. It's the, it's the Father that's in me that does these mir- miraculous things. But the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Jehovah God was in Christ and, and doing all of these work. But there came a day when Jesus had to fulfill his purpose and his passion and what he was there for. That's why they call the last hours of his life the passion of the Christ because that was what he came to do. That's what his, his whole life was, was, uh, was surrounded by this, this one act and that was the act of Calvary. And the man, Christ Jesus, now everybody say the man, the man, Christ Jesus had to become the mediator now between a lost humanity and a holy God. And there's only one man that was capable of doing that. And that was the last Adam, which was Jesus Christ, who was born of incorruptible blood. The first Adam sinned, but the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the man did not sin. Even though he was tempted and tried in every way, such as man, he went, he went to Calvary sinless, and his blood remained pure. Hallelujah. He had to take on the sins of the world, and he had to suffer, and he had to 
die. And I don't know if, if we can even imagine what it been, must have been like on that day. The suffering and the punishment that he didn't even deserve. And being brutally, uh, uh, just uh, uh, horribly beaten and punished for crimes that he didn't even commit. It, it takes my mind back to, to Genesis where we see that Adam, he was not um, uh, deceived by the serpent. He knew full well what his, uh, what his outcome would be when he ate from the tree in the midst of the garden. But he had to do it. He, had, he felt like he needed to do it so that he wouldn't be separated from his bride. So he took on the sin of his bride in that way and he died immediately. The presence of God and the spirit that was with him left him immediately. And here is Jesus, the last Adam, the Bible calls him, and he has to do the same thing. And he comes down sinless blood formed of God in the womb of Mary. And such a miraculous birth and all of these things are happening. But now his passion is here. His purpose in life has come. Decision now. He's praying in the garden and the, and the serpent is there and the serpent is testing and tempting and he refrains. And he says, no, I'm going to do the will of God and I'm going to take on the sin of my bride. Being brutally punished and immorally exposed to the world must have been a horrible, horrible thing. But what must it have been like, I wonder, to be separated from the Spirit of God for the first time in his life? He cries out in Aramaic, he says, why have thou forsaken me? There's a spirit, of, there was a moment in time, and I don't know when it was, that the spirit of the Lord left him. His next words were, I thirst. And they wanted to give him a drink, and he didn't take it, which makes us to believe that he was thirsting for something else. For the first time, the sin that he had taken on. The Bible says that the sin that he took on literally caused him to become physically sick. And the separation now between God and thirsting for the presence of God. Now on the cross, hanging almost lifeless, bleeding his hands from his feet. Jesus left alone now to die. Left alone now as the man. A sacrifice. Now just reduced to a lamb to be slain for the sins of the world. And he cries out, it's finished. It's done. Heaven and earth and all of creation bow at the death of the only begotten. The last Adam took on the sin of his bride and it cost him everything. Everything. what it must be like to know the presence of the Lord as he did and then to lose it. How awful that must be to feel that way. But here he is now, lifeless. Now they're, they're taking down this corpse. I, I can't even imagine what these guys must have been thinking or feeling as they loosened the ropes and took the nails and took the hands and lowered him down to the ground, just a lifeless body. No power left, nothing, just gone and just dead. And they began to wrap him up. No more is he going to walk on water. No more the hands that they're holding going to touch uh, the, the, the blind and, and, and raise the dead. No, no more of the words of life going to speak out of this body. It's just dead. All life and all spirit has, has just left the body. This, this body of Christ has now become gone to deteriorate at a rapid speed, decaying and lying in the hands of these two men. They began to tie him at his feet and at his hands, and they tied him up like this. This is how the Jews would bury. They would tie you up just like very tightly and uh, easier to carry, easier to maneuver. 
And uh, they began to tie him in his hands and his feet. And the Bible says that they literally, the words are, they bound him. They could not move. And, and, and they anointed his body with a hundred pounds of ointments and fragrances to try to somehow slow down the decaying process. Nicodemus there, no doubt, still pondering the Bible study that he received from Jesus that one night in the midnight hour in John chapter 3 and 5 when he comes up to Jesus in the middle of the night and he says, Lord, Rabbi, he says, we know that thou art a master come from God, but because no man can do these miracles that thou do. He's sitting there talking to the manifestation of Jehovah God and he's sitting there, standing there and Jesus looks at him and said, you must, Nicodemus, you've got to understand something about, about life and about death. He said, you must become born again. And he said, how can I enter into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, you, marvel not, he says, I say unto thee, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, or you will never see the kingdom of God, and you will never enter into the kingdom of God. And explaining these things to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus still doesn't understand. And Jesus says, let me tell you, sir, he says, when you're born again of the Spirit, there's a certain sound that you're going to hear. It, 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 it's uh, you, you won't see an outward display. It's going to be a sound that you hear. So is everyone that is born again of the Spirit. And he goes on to tell Nicodemus, you've got to believe, first of all, you have to believe that I am who, that I say that I am. And that's the first step of salvation. He said, for God so loved the world, he said his only begotten Son of the world, that whosoever shall believe in him should not be damned, but shall be saved. And, and, and Nicodemus is, is trying to grasp all this. What, what are you talking about? And he said, Nicodemus, the world loves darkness and they live in darkness. He says, but there's got to come a time when people come out of darkness and they bring their evil deeds into the light. And that's the words that he's trying to explain. You've got to repent of your sins, Nicodemus, and you've got to bring those deeds uh, that the Son of Man might reprove those deeds and, and wash away those sins. And, and here he is now, Nicodemus, just a, a few months uh, later, and he's wrapping up this dead person that he used to communicate with and pondering the thoughts, no doubt, in his mind. Wonder what he was talking about. What does it mean to be born again of water and spirit? I, maybe I'll never know. Maybe it just died right here and, and this message I, I'll never really be able to understand. Now, what somebody know this morning that we are in the same spiritual condition as Nicodemus was when he talked to Jesus. We are spiritually dead in sin. The Bible said that we were born in sin and we were shapen in iniquity. The Bible told uh, that God told Adam in the garden. He said, if you eat of the garden, Adam, you will surely die. And he took on the sin and he ate of the tree. And the Bible says that he died spiritually immediately. There was a death that happened to him. And there was a curse that happened in between he and his wife that every child that was going to be born from their, from their loins and from their, from their blood, from their seed there, every one that was going to be born from them was going to be born a sinner, born dead in spirit. Our bodies are born in the same spiritual condition that Christ was laying in the arms of Joseph and Nicodemus. We are all born bound in grave clothes, born in sin. We're all rotting away at our soul. I remember the day that I realized when I was wearing my grave clothes. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, if, if I knew that that black suit and white shirt and red tie was what I was going to be wearing in my, in my grave uh, for the rest of eternity, so to speak, uh, I probably wouldn't wear it to church. It freaked me out a little bit. I'd be like, no, I'm saving that for another day. I don't want to be caught dead in that thing. Huh. I don't want to be alive in that. It just kind of make you feel kind of weird. You look in the mirror and like, whoa, that's what I'm going to look like there. You cross your arms, you know, wow. Uh, that, that's kind of strange, right? It make you feel little. But I remember the day when I realized I was wearing my grave clothes. Uh, the presence of God was upon me. I remember I could take you to the place I was sitting. I began to look at my life in a whole new light. Uh, I didn't realize. I thought they were just normal every day. Go to, go, to, go to work clothes. But there I am in a church service and the Spirit of the Lord begins to deal with me. And I began to realize my dead condition. 
And I felt the grave clothes tightening in on me. And I felt that my hands were bound for the first time in my life. I realized that, hey, I've been trying to get through life all bound up in all these clothes. And I began to feel the clothes of, of death tighten up around me. And I began to see the coffin that I was living in. And the walls that I had created that I called my life began to, be, to look like a sepulcher all dead and, and, and on the inside. They are beautiful on the outside. Hey, I was a good guy. I was a nice person. And, and I had friends and I got along with people most of the time. But, but praise God at that moment, I realized that I was a dead man even though I was walking around. The walls that I created in my life were, 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 were not life at all. They were just the sepulcher and the stones and the coldness of, uh, 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 of one stone on the next and mortared and round. And pretty soon I was just going to be there forever and for eternity. And, and I began to see the casualties of my life and remorse and regret and unforgiveness started to flood me. And I began to realize that I was bound up in grave clothes. I was a dead man walking. Anybody know what that term's from? It's from death row. And when, when somebody's on death row and he steps out of the cell there and he's walking down that hall, the, the, the guards will call out, dead man walking. That means that there's someone who's sentenced to death. Uh, but he's still alive and they call him a dead man and, and because he's got this death sentence I want you to know that every one of us before we are born again of the water and of the spirit we are dead you might be walking around uh, but you're all tied up uh, and you're all bound and you can't move uh, sir that's why you can't lift your hands in the house of God because you're all bound up uh, that's why you can't do what you what the spirit wants you to do uh, hallelujah but one of these days when you go down the watery grave of baptism and you come out of the water and you speak in tongues as the Lord gives you the utterance friend I promise you uh, those grave clothes are going to end up at the bottom of the baptistry you're going to lift your hands and you're going to magnify God and you're going to become alive in the spirit I had it spent a lifetime trying to stop the decay of my dead spirit I, uh, I filled this body and this emptiness with pounds upon pounds of ointments and preservatives I tried to fill my spirit with alcohol. I, I tried to preserve the rotting away of my family uh, and, the, and the, the deterioration of my self-esteem. I tried to fill all those things with work and, and with a lifestyle that revolved around one party to the next. We cover our bodies with all kinds of preservatives to try to make ourselves look alive. You know what? You don't paint things that are alive. You paint things that are dead. You don't paint fish. You paint barns. You don't paint deer. You paint cars. We try to somehow bring life hundreds of pounds worth of ointment preservatives to try to care for but I'm telling you what when that same spirit that woke Jesus from the dead that same spirit that came into that grave and that sepulcher and rose that dead body from the dead is the same spirit that raises you from your death and fills you with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says it's the same spirit that raised him from the dead. I want you to know that he left his grave clothes there. He didn't bring them with him. He didn't carry them out and say, what are we going to do with all these things? He left those things behind. He came out new. He came out fresh 
When you're born again of the Spirit, the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of, of not the dead waters you used to spew out, no, but now living waters, which is the speaking in tongues part, well, as the Spirit of the Lord now gives them the utterance. Christ did not walk out with his grave clothes on. He left them in the tomb. And when we're born again, once we, or once we were dead in the Spirit, we are now alive and quickened by the Holy Spirit of God. He says in Romans chapter 6, number, uh, verse number 4, Therefore we are buried with Him. How do we go down to death with Him? We are buried with Him when we are baptized into death. That's the likeness of Christ. And then when we are raised up from there, that's just like when Christ was raised up for the glory of the Father. Even so also we should walk in the newness of life. And be born again, not of your mother's seed. No, not from your mother's womb. He says, but from the womb and the preciousness of the Holy Ghost. And, 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 and we are born of the corruptible things. And we are born dead. And we have got to seek a resurrection in life, in the spirit. We have to. Because if we don't get it, then we will not make it in the rapture. He said, if you aren't quickened and born again of the water and the spirit, you can't see the kingdom of God and you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And those who profess me without the Holy Ghost can't do it. There's, we, we have to seek that. Long for. Desire it with everything within us. It has to consume every moment of our lives until we get there. We've got to become desperate for things, for, the, for this awakening. If we have been planted together, the Bible says, in the likeness of his death, then we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, if we be dead with Christ... If we go into the sepulcher with Jesus and we are buried with him, then we are resurrected like he was resurrected. What is he talking about? I wonder what Jesus was talking about. Well, now. Just a few days later, three days to be exact, rumors started spreading around Jerusalem that that dead body, that they all got all anointed up and everything, they stuck it in the, in the grave. Now rumors are having coming around that he's alive. Nicodemus somehow has got to, finding his way to try to find this Jesus. Now, I don't know where he was, but there was a point in time when Jesus says, he tells the whole congregation of people, he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem because you're going to be endued with power from on high because the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. It's the promise that I've been telling you about all this time. And so they go to Jerusalem. I don't know where Nicodemus was in all this. He was either with the 120 because it doesn't name them all, or he was just out there in Jerusalem because he was a Jew and he was a, uh, a Pharisee and, and he was high among the ranks. So he had to be at Passover or he had to be at the, uh, at the uh, Pentecost and the celebration. He had to be in Jerusalem at the time. And there he was. Now the Holy Ghost comes down and filled all the house where they were sitting and appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues. And there had to be a revelation in Nicodemus' mind of the Bible study that he received. Especially when Peter stood up and all the Jews and they said, what do we need to do now that we've crucified God, we laid his body on the cross. The, the, the deliverer, our Moses, we killed him. And now who's going to get us out of here? And they fell to their knees. They were pricked in their hearts. And they said, what do we do? And Peter stood up and he explained the Bible study that Nicodemus received from Jesus himself. And he said, bring your evil deeds into the light. Believe in Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Believe in him. As the scriptures have said, he quoted these Old Testament scriptures. He says, believe in the Lord. They fell on knees and they said, we've crucified the Christ. Yes, you have. 
I'm glad you believe that he's the Christ because that's the first step of salvation. And then he said, repent of your sins. Bring, bring those evil deeds. And I guarantee you, Nicodemus is there somewhere going, Pong, I get it. That's what he was talking about. And then he says, repent of your sins and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Bring those deeds into the light, bro. He says, so that I can reprove them. Born again of the water and the spirit. And then he says, and you shall receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which you have already seen these guys do because you heard them. You heard them. There was a sound that you heard that caused this big ruckus. And all of you came here because there was a sound that you heard. We didn't turn green or purple, no. We didn't. It was, an, it was a sound that you heard. And it was the speaking in tongues. And he says, this is that which was prophesied by your prophet Joel. He ties everything together. And there Nicodemus, can you, I can't even imagine how excited that man must have been. The same Jesus who he bound up in grave clothes and buried in a sepulcher is now filling him with the Holy Ghost. The same spirit that dwelt inside of Jesus is now dwelling inside of the people he's standing around. I wonder if there was a point in time when Nicodemus realized that he was wearing his grave clothes. I want you to know that Jesus Christ, his ministry, the Bible says that he came to set captives free. Free of what? Free of your grave clothes. Are there any captives here today? Is there anybody here today who's not been born again of the water? Buried in his name, in Jesus' name, in the watery grave of baptism? Is there anybody here who's not been born again of the Spirit, which was be receiving the Holy Ghost just like they did in the New Testament? Every single time they spoke in tongues? Then you're a captive, and you need to be set free. But Jesus said, I've come to set. I came to heal the brokenhearted. Has anybody ever had a broken heart in there? I came to open the prison to all of those who are on death row. I came to open the doors. Stand with me. He said, I came to comfort all of you who are in mourning because of the tragedies of a dead life. The Bible says that Christ was given priestly robes by King Herod. A king's garment. But as he walked to Calvary, he traded them. He traded his kingly robes that was given to him by the king of Israel. He gave them and he traded them for grave clothes. And the only reason he did that was so that he could trade with you today. He wants to trade your clothes with you today. He wants to give you the clothes of righteousness and the robes of salvation and the garments of praise and you bring him ashes and you bring him grave clothes and chains. And he did all that. And the reason, because he's victorious out of the grave, you can be victorious out of the grave today. He died so that you could live. He was bound so you could be set free. He removed himself from the presence of God on that faithful day he took on the sins of the world and suffered to death so that we could be resurrected in the Spirit. What a beautiful gospel, Brother Stowe. What, what wonderful good news that is. And I don't know if there's anybody in here today that feels the way I used to feel or the time I came into church. For the very first time, 
I literally felt like I was dead. But with that same spirit that allowed me to realize my dead condition, there was also that beautiful promise that came with that spirit that said, but you don't have to stay. You don't have to die in this condition. Your family doesn't have to live the way that they're living. You can be set free, and I can take all of those things. I want to tell you a story about a man on death row. These people were going in, these apostolic men were going in, they have prison ministry. And they're, they're, they got permission from the warden to go into death row and start teaching these guys. Talk about a captive audience. These guys have no place to go but up. Right? They hit the bottom of society. They're sentenced to death. No appeals, nothing. It's done. And here these men are in there with Nicodemus behind bars. And, uh, and they taught him the same Bible study I just taught you about being baptized in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, but those who are in death row, if they come out of their cell, they have to chain them around their waist, chain them around their ankles and then their wrist, and then everything is chained together, and so they have to walk. Well, this man wanted to be baptized in Jesus' name, and they said, well, that's impossible. The five guards that were there said, no way this is going to happen. He's, he's in death row. We can't even get him out. And they said, well, what if we brought in a horse trough and filled it up right here, and we just did it right here in the hallway on death row? So, well, we'll get clearance from the warden. We'll see. Well, they got God intervened. They got clearance. They brought in this horse trough and five gallon buckets. They came in one at a time. These preachers in ties and suits and they filled this thing up. And they brought the man out and he was all bound up just like, just like the Lord was. Tied, bound. And they lowered him down there. You can't just walk in, you know. You got to hold his feet. They had about five brothers there. And they baptized him in that water trough. And you know what happened? His hands came out first. And he stood up. And the chains that had him bound were at the bottom of the horse trough. And that was a beautiful thing, and it was a, a miraculous deal. But what, what was so beautiful about it was that the five guards that had to be placed there were so moved by what happened. You see, they realized that he's free, but they realized they were bound. And all five of them got baptized with their clothes on. And they said, if the power of the baptistry and the power of God can set this man free in his heart and in his spirit and his physical body, then I want some of that also. And I wonder if there's anybody in the house today that wants to be buried in the name of Jesus and leave your grave clothes and leave your chains in the bottom of the baptistry. <laughs> Bow your heads this morning and close your eyes. Father, I need you today. I come to you sincerely, Father, before you today that if there's ever been a day that I needed to do something for you, it's today. If there's ever a day I needed to follow the Word and follow the Holy Ghost, it's, it's right now. God, I respond to you. I respond to your Spirit. I relinquish myself and my will to you, Father. I want to be set free from everything that has me bound. I want to be loosed today. In the name of Jesus Christ, if anybody wants to come up to this altar this morning and repent of your sins and be baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I want you to know that those things are available for you right now, right here in this very altar. If anybody needs to come forward, I'm opening it up right now for any individual that wants to come up here and just step out and say it's time I'm I'm ready
I'm ready to do this right now. Hallelujah. Anybody right now. All right, now I'm going to invite everybody to come. Anybody needs to come up and just pray. Come to the altar of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Anybody want to be set free this morning? Anybody want to be delivered today? Hallelujah. From anything that's got you afflicted. A physical ailment. An emotional pain. God, I want you to carry away my burdens this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus.